next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Welcome to the City Club, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City Club of Portland. I'm Paddy Tillett, President-elect of the club. The Portland's Park Blocks are the subject of today's presentation by a respected authority on the public realm and how we use it, Fred Kent. He's president of the Project for Public Spaces in New York. But before introducing Fred, I've got some announcements to make. First, a warm summer welcome to new member Carrie Walkowitz, Director of Development for the Nature Conservancy of Oregon. Welcome, Carrie. <laughs> Next week, on Friday the 23rd of June, join us for an important program focusing on the status of Oregon's children with Ramona Foley, who is Director of the State Office for Services for Children and Families. That'll be here at the MAC again. Um, there'll be no program on June the 30th because many of you will be on your way to a 4th of July weekend. So we don't want a thin audience. Um, please notice that there's a coupon in this week's bulletin for updated address and telephone and email information from all club members. Uh, it would be great if you could take the time to fill that out and send it into the club office so that we get our database thoroughly up to date. Our board host today, seated at head table at my far left, is Susan Deskamp, who's a member of the Board of Governors and she's assistant to City Commissioner Charlie Hales. She'll ask the first question of our speaker. Following Susan's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. And please be ready at the microphone to follow immediately after Susan's question so we make the most of our time with Fred. Please identify yourself as a City Club member and, of course, make your question concise, please. Um, broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Portland General Electric, Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt, and the Warehouser Company Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. I've known Fred Kent for many years <clears throat> and continue to enjoy his pragmatic and sometimes disdainful treatment of designs for streets, parks, and squares that he considers burdened by design. He's frankly dismissive of the efforts and the attitudes of many design professions, professionals, I should say. Fred's degrees are in economics and in geography, but he'd probably describe himself as an urban anthropologist, if anything. Fred joined Holly White and others in founding the Project for Public Spaces in New York in 1975. The insights they brought to the design of any public place where people congregate were so compelling that uh, they have found themselves sought after across the country and indeed worldwide ever since. Fred is president of this august organization, and the miles he racks up every year would make an airline pilot blanch. He's advised on everything from small town streets to mighty parks and plazas, from farmers markets to plutocrats palaces all around the world. Two early successes were revitalization of Exxon Park at the Rockefeller Center and Bryant Park, both in New York. Fred's a kind of urban space alchemist, turning dubious and underperforming spaces into vital components of the community. We're very fortunate to have him with us today to share his wisdom on the possible futures of the Portland Park Blocks. Please welcome Fred Kent. I uh, thought when I first came to Oregon that I should, should wear a wetsuit. Uh, and uh, that has quickly disappeared as an idea because I've been here 30 nights in the last uh, six months, and it has yet to rain in Portland. 
<laughs> so, but I, I do, <laughs> it wasn't in a row, but I do remember very distinctly uh, my first trip, I did wear, bring one of those, uh, you know, those New England yellow slickers that you, pants and suit, because, you know, in New England we get these northeasters and the rain comes this way instead of that way. And uh, so that was the first trip. And then uh, when I started coming more often this year, I, I brought an umbrella uh, and a raincoat. And now I don't even bring an umbrella because I know it's always sunny here. So, but I, but I was exposed to uh, some rain the last time I was here. Unfortunately, it was out in Baker City, uh, which only gets 10 inches of rain a year. And then we had a little snow on the coming over on the pass with Brian Scott. So. Um, you know, and when you get here, what's so interesting is you, you're, you start a conversation with people, and I know between 30 seconds and 45 seconds they're going to say something about the weather. I know. It just happens. It's sort of like uh, we have this old uh, saying that I, is sort of our edict is you can see a lot just by observing. And so we're always watching and observing and, and listening. And, uh, and that, the only thing that I guess is wrong about that, and the only time I've ever discovered that that was wrong, is that it does rain in Portland. It's just that I've never seen it. So uh, you know, am I right by observing and not having any rain, or am I wrong because it is the only time I've ever been wrong about you can see a lot just by observing. So uh, I am really delighted to be here, and in fact, I have spent more nights here uh, in the last three months than I have in Brooklyn, New York, where I live. Uh, but I've been on a lot of other places, too. So I don't know whether you have to pay taxes uh, <laughs> then or not. I don't know. So, uh, But you're <laughs> working on it, right? So I have, uh, I've had the most incredible experiences here, uh, working in neighborhoods with Brian Scott all over this state and, and this city. And uh, so I'm going to have a few comments on, on that, which I, I want to share with you. I've been in uh, Newburgh, Baker City, Umatilla, Springfield, and Eugene uh, this spring, uh, working to create sort of civic places. And it has been such an extraordinary thrill to meet the people in those communities and the kind of uh, enormous desire to sort of have some participation or in a place that they call a civic, a civic realm. Uh, and I think that's something that's going on all over this country. We're working on sort of central square civic spaces everywhere. But when I come here, there seems to be a lot more what we call zealous nuts than in the rest of this country. And I don't think a city can survive or become a great city without zealous nuts. And I guess that's what you are here. Is that true? Maybe. So. But each of those, individually, each of those experiences were just marvelous. And uh, Brian Scott and I were, you know, we'd come out of these meetings and we'd see all this energy on these people and we would just get thrilled by, by it and we'd be elevated all the way back to wherever we were going. But I've also had the experience of working in Hollywood and St. John and Brooklyn and Milwaukee and a whole bunch of other neighborhoods here. And we did this place game with a, with a planning department, which was uh, also a great pleasure and training uh, some of the planning staff about building community places. Uh, and that seems to be really grabbing hold. And so what I have one recommendation, which is I think all the city commissioners should change their jurisdiction. Now, I know Jim Francisconi here is here and Charlie Hales. So Charlie Hales should be commissioner of transportation and public spaces. Jim Francisconi should be commissioner of parks and public spaces. Now, and, and the mayor should be commissioner of planning and public spaces. And then public works should be public works and public spaces. Because I had one of the most incredible experiences of my career out in, is it Gateway Village? Is that really what it is? Gateway Center or something. I mean, I didn't, it's not a village. But we were out there, and, uh, and it was a very disturbing experience because the community wanted some public spaces. And the Parks Department was there to try to find land that they could buy for a park. It might have been a block. This is with the Portland Development Commission. And, uh, but when we started looking around, the shopping centers and the community center and the schools and the hospital and uh, 
some of the neighborhood streets, you could see all kinds of possibilities for great public spaces, the streets, the, the spaces that were sort of in between. And it got me really thinking and really energized by the fact that there is no city in this country that has a Department of Public Spaces. And when I first got to know Charlie Hales, he said he was then the commissioner for planning, transportation, and parks. And he felt that he was kind of the public space person because no one else was dealing in public spaces. Transportation was doing their thing, planning was doing their thing, and parks was doing their thing. So what I, and I mean this extremely seriously. If I think Portland could lead the way and become a city of great public spaces. But in order to do that, it has to have a really concerted effort on the part of the great citizens and the, and the uh, professionals and the politicians to do that. So that is a, I, I really want to emphasize that. I'm trying to find a way to write that up and get that out because uh, nowhere in this country is that happening and I think it could happen here. So take that very, very seriously. So the other thing that I wanted to do is just tell you there's two things that are, that are absolutes in my mind. A great public space is 80% management, okay? And it is also has to have good edge uses. So what I want to now talk about is the park blocks. And um, I am extremely excited about the vision that different people have for the park blocks. I am also sort of intrigued by the idea of La Rambla. But the way it was depicted in my to my way of thinking was almost a non-starter. It was not a strong proposal. Uh, and I think that in order to make that whole effort uh, really burst out, that you have to take that and evolve that whole concept to a much higher level. I think the other idea of retaining build those buildings and some of them are beautiful and historic buildings, is also a great idea. But the streets and the buildings themselves need to come alive. And so either way, the city wins. But if it's a divisive issue and you have these two camps working at, at odds, uh, you won't get anywhere. And the whole point is to create a, a, a necklace of pearls, of different colored pearls, and different kinds of public spaces from one end to the other. I love what the Portland Development Commission did with that park in the North Blocks. And we arrived, and all of a sudden, all these kids poured out of cars and the school across the street and, and, and occupied that place. And you know, to think that that wasn't possible even you know, a year or so ago, and just to see how you can grow a public space. And that, I think, is the real goal. That that a public space, you have to grow public spaces. They are not static. You don't design it and walk away. Uh, one of the problems I have with designers is that they do a design and that's it. And a great public space is about creating an extraordinarily vital, managed, uh, dynamic public space. And so you have all these park blocks that all need to be looked at anew. And so I'm going to show you some slides and that's, uh, to, to sort of show you how other cities have done it. Because to tell you the truth, I find those park blocks pretty boring. Uh, pretty, in a sense, thin in terms of what can happen there. And I have a very, very high standard in terms of public spaces. Extremely high. So don't think of me as being critical, but think of me as challenging you all to create one of the greatest series of public spaces that are possible. So how do I do this? Okay, so can we turn the lights down? Is that a, a possibility? So uh, what, we, what we need is extraordinary boldness in our city. Uh, and uh, this, just, this was on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, and I was blown away by it when I saw it. And it was such a thrill to see it, and it was there on a temporary basis. So you can borrow it and bring it here, if you like. <laughs> so our, our mission, we're a nonprofit organization, is to build community, to create community places using community common sense. So you're going to see as I go through this short presentation 
that the experts are the community and the people in the community and that the designers and the professionals need to be resources to you, the experts. And I'm going to talk about partnerships and I'm going to talk about looking at special places in block after block after block. And we, we run a public market program, we run an urban parks institute, we run a public buildings program, uh, and we run a transportation program. And all of those are aspects of these public spaces, of the park blocks. The market idea is critical for block five. Uh, absolutely essential, I think, to have various kinds of markets in the downtown. And block five, I think, is an absolutely supreme choice for, for, uh, for you. Park, the Park Block 5, is that what you call it? Is that what you call it? Yeah. Is that everyone on target on that? The Moyer Block. The Moyer Block, okay? Everyone got that? So I always like to start with these slides because um, there's a human being in there that you can barely see uh, at the bottom of, the, of that archway. And uh, what? And an auto. And an auto, right, thank you. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is, in Houston, that's considered congestion. <laughs> but anyway, and they, right, build it and they will come, right. Anyway, this is a Philip Johnson building, and the president of the bank hates this building, and he says the only people that like it are the architect and the interior designers who come and uh, praise it. And uh, to us, it's, it's uh, in a way, the kind of architecture that we've had much too much of. And a lot of the cities I go to, we're still getting objects like that that are unrelated to human beings. Uh, and we always say between the architect and the traffic engineer, they've created a pedestrian-free environment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is the other extreme. I mean, it's not even an extreme. Actually, the great markets of India, I don't know if uh, Rajiv Batra's here, uh, but if he's a friend from Portland, and we went all over uh, India together looking at uh, these amazing markets. But this is a street that you can go down a thousand times and see something new every time. And I think we need to move more in this direction than in the other direction of neat, clean, and empty, look but don't touch, no people, no problem, kind of the repressed kind of uh, white Anglo-Saxon idea of how we live our lives. And we need to open up to a much more diverse, eclectic, chaotic, exciting, dynamic, uh, extraordinarily interesting uh, kind of uh, settings, and I think that's where the park blocks can, can move in that direction dramatically. Uh, so we get even churches like this, and you have some beautiful churches downtown, but the pastor of that church was uh, standing out there with me, and he was looking at the houses on the right, thinking how he could expand his parking lot. I was thinking about this church in Coyacan in Mexico, which is a center of community activity. And you go there 30 times a week, and you also go to church and many other things. So th we don't do this, and this is where community life, I think, would prefer to be in these kinds of places. Uh, we build, our, build buildings like this. This is the Pritzker Prize award winner in San Antonio. In case you can't tell, it's a library. Uh, the way to get there is by car. There's a bus stop at the end of the blank wall on the left there, and I watched this uh, elderly lady get off and, and struggle down the street into the entranceway, which was reserved for cars, down into the, where the library was. And I said, this is awful. This is just truly awful. Uh, but there are libraries. And the one in, there is a library in the back on the left, but there's a church there. Uh, and, there's a, and that's one of the great hotels in the world, or Mission Inn, down in, uh, Rivers, in Riverside, California. And that's a central square. And they have performances on the, on the porch. Uh, and, it's, and you go to the library as well. Uh, so triangulation is something that I'll come back to again and again. <laughs> and then we've built our streets, uh, and we have to get our friends together to go across them. And, uh, it's a people island. It's a, right, definitely. <laughs> and boy, did they, if you look at the woman's arm, she's almost drawing blood <laughs> trying to get. <laughs> but anyway, this, this is actually symptomatic of, of this whole culture in the last 50 years worldwide of where we have just accentuated the, the importance of the uh, traffic engineer and we've just sort of bowed and caved in to the whole idea that we've got to be beholden to that automobile. In fact, one of your city engineers here said, you know, back about 50 years ago, we used to be, um, our traffic engineering was about people and then we started to be more object oriented, more about the vehicle. And now we're getting back to thinking about people again and it's a big transition. And we got a job in New Jersey uh, 
about three months ago to train all the traffic engineers on how to build community places. Uh, it just blew me away. I never thought, I always thought traffic engineers, whatever a traffic engineer says, do the opposite and you'll be building your community, uh, was, my, was my edict uh, to every community I went to. And that's changing fast in the engineering profession. Actually, I think, just to be a little bit provocative, uh, can change a lot faster than the uh, architecture profession. Uh, because the architecture profession is, is tied up in its ego and the engineering profession is tied up in its engineering prowess and they can turn one direction or the other very easily. You can ask them to slow cars down, you can ask them to create community places, and they can, and an architect has a lot harder time getting out of the ego to be a resource to a community. So of those of you who are architects, I'm advocating that there's a very different role uh, about building place and community place is about not having an ego, it's about being a resource. And when you focus on place, you do everything different. You do everything different when you focus on place. A traffic engineer asked to create a place is a real challenge. An architect asked to create a place is an extraordinary challenge. So uh, we, we, we don't allow this yet. Uh, you know, having your own seat in a parking space. Uh, and then we get into the design of parks. This is in La Valette in, in uh, Paris, which just, uh, I think, is abusive to human, uh, to human beings. And it gets used, but if you want to sit, you have to, f you can't face each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to ride a bicycle, I guess you can, but... But we don't think about sort of the whole social dynamic, the human dynamic of how uh, how you move through space, where you walk, the triangulation, the idea of, of putting different uses together, of the joy of, of flirting, uh, flirting with other people. There's this whole thing in Washington right now where there was an article about flirting, and Washington is not a good city for flirting. And what they really are mean, is, mean is eye contact, uh, is acknowledging other people. Uh, smiling in a certain way when you see other people. And a good city is about that. It's about the pleasure of watching people and being watched. Uh, and, uh, and then you get this kind of a design. This has got an award, too. Uh, you follow that path, you turn right, you follow the path, you turn right, you follow the path, and you're in a blank wall. Uh, and uh, I don't know how you could ever get a design award for that. We call a lot of the designers form freaks because uh, they're only about form, they're not about place. Uh, but then you get this, uh, where in the center of Paris on a cold December day, I was walking through and this wonderful woman was reading her book in a fur coat uh, with boots on in the middle of Luxembourg Gardens. Uh, that's pretty special uh, when you get that. So that we have to think about all the different kinds of weather. And I think this may be art. I'm not sure what it is, uh, but it's a, a new park in Barcelona. And uh, you certainly don't see this kind of activity of kids exploring uh, human form uh, with great interest. So we shape our buildings, and afterwards our, shape their, our buildings shape us. We shape our public spaces, and afterwards they shape us. We shape our streets, and afterwards they shape us. So uh, we also use this term nibbling, which is uh, we've been nibbled at uh, enormously. Uh, by, by various professions and disciplines and orientations that have not been around building community or community places. And so we need to nibble back. And in, in some cases, we need to take giant bites. And I think what you did with Pioneer Courthouse Square was an enormous shift that this whole country benefited from and has benefited for, from enormously. But I think you have to go to new heights here and take on a whole new agenda. Uh, you know, and, uh, and Jim Francione, Francis Coney came up and, and told me about some of the efforts at the park the Parks Department now is going to be broader about expanding it beyond just parks, but also working on some of these community places, which I think is wonderful. So then Holly White, our mentor, said it is difficult to design a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often it's been accomplished. Uh, so I believe 100% that great cities are great public spaces, are great parks. Uh, and that's why we go and travel the world, is going to these great public spaces and seeing uh, these extraordinary streets and parks and plazas and squares and cultures and uh, art and all that kind of stuff. And so that's what I think y you have the job. You have the responsibility. Uh, you're such a great city of great people uh, that you've got to go for that. So I want to go through a little challenge with you. Uh, and I'm not sure you can read this, but I'll try to help you. I want you to think of a block that's in a park block and sort of fix on that for a minute and then think about it in your own mind in terms of is it, 
comfort, is it comfortable and have a good image? Does it seem clean and well-maintained? Does it feel safe? Is it human scale? Is it a, I can't see, attractive? Uh, are there places to sit? So take that block in your own mind and evaluate it good, fair, or poor. Then take uh, and look at access. Is it identifiable from a distance? Is it walkable? Is it connected to adjacent buildings? Remember, good, fair, or poor. Just in your mind, try to think of this. And then uses and activity. Are there a variety of things to do? It is, appealing, is it appealing to different ages? Uh, is it fun? Is it special, unique? Uh, does it have local character and uses? And then finally, uh, sociability, which is the most important. Does it have a lot of social interaction? Are people in groups? Uh, is there a sense of place? So just think about your blocks. And then what I would, I, I went out last night and I looked at some of those blocks and I could pick one, maybe the one uh, where the art museum is. And uh, you could sort of rate it. And you begin to see that, gee, some of those things aren't so good there. And so you start focusing on that. And so think about that as we go through these slides. And then think about the next part. What do you like best about that particular block? And list three things that you would do in the short term to improve that block. Uh, and then think about it in terms of the longer term and what would have its biggest impact in the longer term. And then ask someone in that uh, space what they would do to improve it. And then we added another one that isn't on here about what kind of partnerships would help to make that space more exciting and more dynamic. So uh, I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, this is a place called Kunstergarten in Sweden. It's the central square in Sweden. And it's an extraordinarily wonderful, wonderful park. And about 1953, they made it into the city's central square. It kind of reminded me of your park blocks. A lot of trees, walkways. Uh, you can walk under the trees very nicely. It's very beautiful. And so what they did is they turned it into this. Uh, they have a skating rink in the wintertime there. Uh, it's one of the most extraordinarily busy places. Uh, if you're interested in public spaces, this is one you should go to. Uh, and, uh, but some of the things they do is that they bring flowers out in the summertime, and that's where the skating rink is in the winter. They have a, uh, restaurants that they bring out on a temporary basis for the summer. Uh, they have games, uh, chess, and, uh, and playground equipment that they bring out on a temporary basis. They have ping pong and other kinds of activities and art shows. and. Things like that. I know you have art shows. There was an art. There's a, a Portland Art Festival up there, but it was so funny. We went up there, and the only thing that was on the grass were three cars. It seemed a little strange, and the cars were occupying the grass, and the and the uh, booths were occupying the street. Uh, and then, if you go to Luxembourg Gardens and the glorious flowers that are there seasonally, you just you you come away elevated, and you kind of it. It, it draws your uh, at attention. When you think of Paris, you go back and you think about those extraordinarily beautiful flowers in Luxembourg Gardens, if you were there. Uh, and it's just, I don't even see how you can do something so beautiful. Uh, it's so extraordinary. And how they're just, uh, they sort of jump out at you uh, in great profusion uh, all over the place. And then if you take Central Park and the great fountains that are in Central Park, and you don't have very good features or very many features. Uh, that really jump out at you and that are those kinds of major attractions. And then Bryant Park, where we were brought in, there were nine groups of people dealing in drug and we did drugs, and we did this uh, plan and it, for this park here. It's about five acres. Um, and this is what it looked like before. And uh, you even felt undesirable going into it. Uh, and now it's this, uh, with all kinds of uh, amazing activity and flowers and uh, movable seating. and. Uh, it's just sort of the spiritual center of that whole part of the city. Uh, and, uh, and I think you can do, this is what it was like before. It was closed off, cut off, and now it's opened up uh, dramatically so you can get in more easily and it uh, draws you in many, many ways. Uh, it has restaurants and uh, cafes and uh, it even has bowling. Uh, they had a bowling demonstration in there which kind of blew me away. Uh, and then uh, fashion shows and uh, water and kids and families and, uh, and chess uh, and other games. Uh, and they have movies at night in that space. So it's programmed all the time. You know, like your Pioneer Courthouse Square, uh, you need to have extraordinary programming and management of all those park blocks uh, in order for them to be as successful. Now, I want to shift a little bit 
um, because I had another seminal experience when I started working with Holly White. I went out and started looking at Lexington Avenue between 57th and 59th Street. And I spent the summer sort of observing and interviewing and watching the activity on the street. And it no longer exists. Most cities have sterilized themselves. And they've taken all of these amazing uses out. And they may not look good to you, but they are amazing what happens uh, in them. And this was uh, a little store. And I interviewed the, uh, the owner of that store. And I said, gee, there's 35,000 people going by this, your store on a daily basis. You must be very happy to be here. And he said, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm next to a bank. And people start walking faster when they go by the bank. And it takes them two or three stores to slow down and get back into a win window shopping rhythm. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Because that's what a great street is about. It's about creating a rhythm that is so dynamic that you're sucked in and drawn in by all kinds of things that are going on. And we're a little too pure. And we, are, we look more at how things are designed than how people use them. Uh, and, and that was quite a remarkable uh, comment. Uh, but when you look at great streets, some of the great streets of the world, this is one of the highest performing streets in the world is Madison Avenue. There are, I guess, 12 or 15 stores right there. They're all double level. And each window has to attract your attention. And so they pay enormous, enormous attention to the window displays. And they do it at night as well. And they light it up. And uh, you know, you're, when you look at the streets, the, what is it, the South? What do you call the two streets? There's Ninth and Park. Park. There's two. One is Ninth and the other one is Park. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there are other streets. And uh, Paris has just redone Le, the uh, Champs Elysees. And uh, you know, they put amazing street furniture in it. And uh, all kinds of, uh, they have these art shows and things like that. Uh, so as we look around the world, we should look more than at La, La Rambla. La Rambla is, is a very interesting street, but the energy is all in the center of the street. It's not on the sides. And what someone said, I guess Powell's in one of the articles that I read, I kind of agreed with that. And I was worried that if you did a La Rambla, which is the way it was shown, was a lot more passive and, and, and wouldn't, you, you don't have enough people here to make that really work. So we have to go up a couple of notches in terms of what you do in that space. And you know, a market is part of it, uh, all kinds of activity that keep you aware of the edge uses on the buildings if you end up taking down the buildings in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the street to, to continue the park blocks. Uh, and just a few more of these. And then this is one of another very high performing street in Germany, in Dusseldorf, uh, where uh, they have all these activities, both on the curbside and on the street side. And, and great street furniture. Uh, see, they even take up parking spaces for that cafe. And uh, the street scene is, is incredibly enjoyable from those cafes that are on the curbside as well. So uh, you know, there's a whole lot of principles in building a great street, building great public spaces, doing markets. And we would just put this in front of, your, of you and offer the idea of how you create a great public space. It's sort of a, uh, the cliff notes to our work over the last 25 years. And we find that the community is the expert. And that is absolutely without, uh, there's no, absolutely no doubt about that. And the more I work, the more I realize the community is the expert. And I keep thinking of Izzy from Springfield, who uh, is just one of the greatest live wires I've ever met, who loves the idea of the Civic Square there, is doing an art uh, complex in a historic building. And she just, you know, she's just alive with, with energy and fervor. And uh, she's the expert. And she's, boy, is she going to make that place happen? Uh, and, and that's what we find in the communities. You find these people who are, who are really grounded in that community that are the experts. Uh, and that we're creating places, not design. A place is about 100 times more important than design. Uh, and, and that is a, just absolutely basic. It's absolutely basic, because we think that a place is about people. It's about w people's aspirations. It's about how they show themselves off. It's about, uh, it's about the heart and the soul of a community. That's what a place is about. Uh, and we've got to have partners. You know? And when you start thinking about partners, if you start realizing the potential partners that are available, you might end up with 100 potential partners. Uh, that could work on the park blocks. I bet even a thousand for the park blocks because there's so many different uh, people and act and hobbyists and uh, advocates and so on that could be part of the creating the great park blocks. 
And then always think about observing. You know, as you wander around the world, as you look in your communities, observe what people do. Think of that place game that I showed you about how a place functions in terms of comfort and image, activities and uses, access and linkage, and sociability. And it gives you all kinds of clues about what is good and bad about a space. And then it helps you to think about what you could do to make it better. Have a vision. And the vision is not about design. A vision is about what people do in a place. So take, the, take it more as a, as, a, as, a, as a vision of uses uh, in your mind. And that's what is more important than a design vision. Uh, and, and then experiment and experiment and experiment and test. And you have so many park blocks that you could begin to experiment with and develop a whole agenda around creating the world's greatest uh, series of park blocks in the world. A lot of cities have them. Uh, and it would be good to look at. Oslo has one, Paris has some, uh, you know, the ones I showed you in Stockholm are in a sense park blocks. So, so look around the world and, and explore as you build your great city. Uh, triangulate, three, four, five uses together, put them together. I always think of uh, when you have a, uh, a, bu a uh, bench, a wastebasket, and a telephone, if you line them up along a wall, you'll get one kind of use, but if you put them together, you get a whole different kind of use. And then if you add a vendor or a bus stop, uh, and then you can actually create a little place. So that, but then you can also say take a, uh, a uh, library and, and the children's reading room and the children's playground and a coffee shop and you put them right together. How do you design the library? And where in America has that been done? It hasn't been done to my knowledge yet. Uh, so then there are people who are going to say, oh, you can't do it. And Yogi Berra uh, says if they say it can't be done, it doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> and uh, I love those battles. Uh, we were having a great one in Fort Worth. We're doing the Civic Square, and the traffic engineers uh, have this mantra, but you haven't paid attention to parking. But we're going to have to have, you know, in the year 2020 or 40, we're going to have to have more vehicles going through here. And I, and I keep saying, just wait, just wait. We're going to develop the concept, and then you're going to design it to support the concept. You know, you're, you're not important anymore. The place is more important than you are. And you have driven everyone out of the city, so now we're going to bring people back into the city. So, and then form supports function. Uh, design is critical, absolutely critical, but it's around the functions. And it can grow and change and evolve over time. That's 80% of a good space is management. Uh, so infrastructure is critical. Money is not the issue. If money is the issue, then you have the wrong idea. Uh, I was reviewing the plan for the Civic Square in uh, Vancouver uh, yesterday, and uh, the designers had gotten it up to $4 million. Uh, it was no longer a good design. Uh, they were in it more for their ego than they were for, their, uh, for what it would do for that community. And they've scaled it back. I think it's going to start out at $900,000 and then gradually grow as they begin to develop uses and add to it. And then they can make a great public square out of it. And then finally, you're never finished. Uh, uh, if you walk away from it, uh, it'll just flounder and it'll atrophy and get back. So, in closing, I want to, this is a Harvard Business School professor, John Cotter, and he came and gave some talks at some of our conferences about change. And uh, so the idea is to attack complacency, organize a strong team, develop a vision. And you see, that's what I think is the most important thing, is have a vision for the park blocks, for the idea of La Rambla greatly expanded, uh, the idea of retaining the buildings, but greatly expanded. And, and then proceed and see where you end up. Because you may not, it may be 20 or 30 years uh, before you get to the ultimate. <laughs> but you could get started right away in building what can be these great public spaces. So then uh, become group, group, great communicators. Search for the impediments. There will be a lot of impediments there. Produce the short-term wins, which we're talking about. Take on bigger challenges. Connect change to the culture of the community about creating great public spaces, about great community places. Uh, you do that, and you will again lead this country uh, in building great cities. And that's what I think people are really wanting, again, building great cities and towns. And celebrate. Have one of the greatest pancake breakfasts uh, in the world, all along those park blocks. And then have people ask, think about what they would do to, to enhance them. Play the game out there on those park blocks. And then Holly White said, I end then in praise of small spaces. The multiplier effect is tremendous. It is not just the number of people using them, but the larger number who pass by and enjoy them vicariously, or even the larger number who feel better about the city center for knowledge of them. For a city, such places are priceless, whatever the cost. 
They are built of a set of basics, and they are right in front of our noses if we will look. So Yogi Berra says, if they say it can't be done, it doesn't always work out that way. So you have, I hope, you have such an, an enormous responsibility, not just for Portland, but for this country, to get us out of kind of an era of uh, cities that just haven't been working into a new era of cities that are great cities. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Don't go away. Um, I'm concerned about something that was in the paper this morning that most of you saw, and that is that Portland uh, has this terrible record of pedestrian safety. And to me, a crucial aspect of public space and, uh, well, you know, sidewalk um, safety, it's obvious why there's accidents happening on the hundreds of, of, of roads that we have in the city of Portland without sidewalks. But what are we doing wrong? And in your international travels, um, if we don't feel safe on a downtown street attempting to cross in the walkway, how are we going to make these public spaces thrive? How are we going to get more people out of their cars when you feel so threatened? That's a great question, because when we were walking down the park blocks when I got here on Thursday, uh, there are no crosswalks going from one park block to the next as you get down into the, I don't know, I know some of them there are, some mid-block crossings, but as you get down into uh, whatever, d down near O'Brien Square, is that it? Yeah, but as you, there, you, you feel like you're out on your own there. Uh, and I think the city needs to much more aggressively identify uh, the crosswalks for pedestrians, and then uh, also do uh, raised platforms so that they can cross. And then you go to streets like, uh, like uh, Hollywood Boulevard, you know, and, and Sandy, right out there. That's just, it's the wrong street. And you have a highway going right next to it, and then you have your light rail. Uh, and that street is not compatible with that community. And it's the same with Brooklyn in the Brooklyn neighborhood. And then I was in Milwaukee in neighborhood, and uh, someone there, after we did a presentation, said uh, we wanted a public sp space, and they gave us a median. Uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, I think that we're at the beginning of a, uh, of a whole new era of thinking about traffic engineers. And, and you've got some very good ones here, and then you've got Charlie Hales who's going to lead the way uh, in doing that. So. Uh, it's an exciting time. It really is. Charlie Davis, member. Can you tell us something that billboards and painted walls do for a community? <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't see any in Luxembourg Gardens. Right. No, but I don't. see them all over the city of Portland right. in greater right. profusion than yeah. since uh, 40 years. Well, I wish I had actually shown a picture that... Um, I really like, I was in Berlin right after the wall came down, and uh, there was this, uh, people wanted to recreate a historic building. And it happened to be an old palace. And they put this scrim up and a, on a scaffolding, and they showed what it would be like. And it sort of changed my idea of, you know, I think a lot of, of I, I, I actually have to say I like murals. And Springfield has one of the greatest murals I've ever seen on one of their walls. It's an absolutely gorgeous mural. And if you can get great murals and great uh, banners and things, I think it enhances. But I think there's an awful lot of bad ones, too. Uh, but the scrim idea is actually something you can do on a temporary basis. And you can kind of use it as a way to depict what you might like to have in the future. I'm Ray Polani, a City Club member. Welcome to Portland, uh, Mr. Kent. Uh, if you want to meet one of the zealous nuts, here is one. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Now, uh, you talked about Gateway. Yes. You know what the problem is with Gateway? The parking. Yes. It's yes. nothing but parking. It is. It's a and lot yet, of parking lots, right. And yet, that is the biggest transit center yeah. with the most transit lines coming together of the entire region. Right. But there's nothing but parking. I know. So people and automobiles, that's the problem. Too many together. Right. OK. Can uh, I respond to that, or are you making a question out of that? <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is very simple. They are proposing for the park blocks a garage underneath for 3,500 automobiles. My suggestion is for a subway down there, 
for thousands of people coming through from north, south, east, and west, the entire region. That's thousands of people that can come there yeah. and do what they want to do without being on the streets, without clogging. They get out and they live. But they move in and out underground on a subway. I think it's essential. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think as cities grow, they, they start, you know, you, you went right for the light rail, which I think is absolutely fabulous. And now you're doing this streetcars, which I think is, is as bold as any city in this country is doing. And I, I really compliment you. I think that heavy rail is also should be considered an option and maybe a subway system. Uh, and it should be out in the sort of 30 year planning time horizon. And I agree with that. Uh, another fellow, I don't know, if, I don't think he's here, but John Russell, I had, a, had lunch with him and Charlie Hales, and he was talking about the idea that he think we're in a new era, uh, that we had the City Beautiful movement at the end of the last century, or the, between the uh, 18th and 19th century. And uh, we, we had this enormous effort to rebuild and create great cities. And he thinks it's the time again to do that again because we've been so inundated by uh, the automobile and it's everywhere in our lives. It's, it's just, it's overwhelming us. And, and I think people are beginning to realize that and that we need to sort of say, uh-uh, not, not here, not there. Let's, let's start moving it back uh, and, and bring it into context of how it serves a community rather than how it ruins a community. So uh, I think that's, that's right. And I think that's why I wouldn't advocate parking under the under the park blocks. I, I just think that we should forget about parking. It costs too much money. We put too much subsidy into it. We don't think about creating great public spaces. You have great public spaces. Everyone is going to swarm to those. Uh, uh, Faneuil Hall in Boston uh, had virtually no parking, and yet all these people from the suburbs would come there because it was such a great place to go to. Uh, so if you create great places, people will find ways to get there, and then they'll begin to dominate and, and support a better transit system. Parking shaped us. Right, right, that's right. <laughs> yes, sir. Good afternoon. Erwin Randall, City Club member. About three things. First of all, the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris doesn't have a market, but no. it does have Palais Luxembourg, which yes. brings people right. in. It's an old yeah. royal palace yeah. that helps. Uh, Madison, I'm a former New Yorker. Madison Avenue in New York may be lit up at night, but it's as dead as a doornail. People do not walk those blocks because there is nothing there other than nicely lit storefronts. South Park blocks here. I live on the South Park blocks. Yeah. I think you picked the wrong block to look at. Granted that the Art Museum block just has Teddy Roosevelt sitting up there and the Art Museum and the History Station. Teddy Roosevelt is in great company. However, move up a few blocks and take a look at us when it doesn't rain, as you found out. <laughs> Give me a day of rain. Give me a day of rain. <laughs> <laughs> there are times I pray I for it. <laughs> but we have uh, a, mo a public market every Wednesday right, up on PSU. Market, right. We have a public right. market on uh, every Wednesday, yeah. that was Saturday, on Wednesday at the foot of the South Park blocks. You have school children coming out of the daycare and playing yeah. on the sculpture on the park blocks. Yeah. You have people constantly moving up and down. I think your illustration was very wrong for the South Park blocks. La Rambla's concept for the Central Park or Middle Park yeah. blocks, whatever you want to call them, it wasn't just a matter of tearing down the buildings. It was taking that 100-foot uh, section now and dividing it up taking 50 or 60 feet of it and leaving that as a center walkway, yeah. but then taking the and remaining the space, right. widen and the sidewalks, put out, cafes right. out there and right. everything else. Yeah. That's a very different issue. Uh, why the criticisms? Gotcha, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think... I just I, made that. Well, when the... Uh, the uh, South Park blocks, when, when you think about how other cities has, have transformed their parks from sort of attractive, passive, mediocre into extraordinary, extraordinary places. Like Central Park is, is the greatest park in the world. And 20 years ago, it was really awful and dull. And now it's just full of life. And it handles enormous numbers of people in a very gracious, quiet, peaceful, wonderful way. Uh, so my vision is more of those 
kind of experiences, how Bryant Park turned itself around, how all over the country people are looking at parks again. Our, our Urban Parks Institute is about uh, parks as community places, about re-energizing and enlivening them. And, and so I look at that and I don't see that as the vision of the future. I see that as what has been the past. Uh, as, as far as the La Rambla, uh, definitely bring out those sidewalks and expand them and add enormous activity. But the center, there's two, we have this rule in our in our work where anything over 39 feet uh, is too wide because you can't get, you can't see the shops on one side or the other. So you need a kind of a, a, a dimension of about 39 feet where there's activity that draws you, kiosks, uh, market, uh, event space, and things like that. So that you might split people down two sides uh, and there might be something in the middle that would help to create it and on the sides of the building. But La Rambla, if you've been there, and I've been there at least yearly for the last five years, uh, has great uses outside off of it. The edge uses are fairly weak, and people walk down the center and not uh, going over to the edge. You don't find many people crossing the street over to the uses across, uh, across the street. So I think we have to look at it a lot harder and a lot more closely, and then come up with a series of, of of uh, solutions that are so special for each block that they jump out at you and then you say, yes, we want to take those buildings down because we've got a much better alternative. So. Hi. Whoops. Hi. Jillian Detweiler, City yes. Club member. Um, in Portland, we've made a lot of progress in adding housing to our downtown. Yes. So we yes. have residents here 24 right. hours a day, but you must work in a lot of cities where housing downtown hasn't happened and people aren't thinking about that. What's your advice about the mixture you need or the housing you need to support public space and have it be uh, lively or at least not scary yeah. more hours of the day? Well, I, my first thought is when we were working, we were walking up to the North Park, Park blocks, I hadn't really been there before. And to see that playground there, and then I kind of looked at the buildings on both sides and I kind of thought, God, if that were residential, what impact that would have on that space? I mean, I just could see tremendous amounts of additional residential there. And then if you think of the area to the west of the park blocks and how with this vision of creating a great park, series of park blocks, the blocks to the west become great opportunities for residential. So your, your city is maybe only at the beginning of, I think, what could be an extraordinarily important residential uh, uh, explosion. If you take that and then you cover over that highway and you do that there, wow, what a city. Uh, you know, and then it would support those, uh, those park blocks. So I'll bet you're, I think you're only at the very tip of the iceberg in terms of the potential for residential in downtown, uh, I think. It was just an observation. Let me interject a, a question from the, from the uh, audience here. Actually, I'll combine two. One is that, um, a new Star of Firm Hotel and an aging private club are all that separate the uh, Block 5 from the South Park blocks. <laughs> Is that one of those things that can't be done and dealt with? <laughs> and, and, and the other part of it is, um, if the community is the expert, how can we realistically get uh, more of the community involved in getting to a vision? <laughs> I'm not going to touch that first one with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> I, I think it's, you know, actually what I really think is that if you've got a great vision and it's so powerful and so strong, then, you know, then maybe they come down because it's so important. But right now, the vision you have and what you've got, that building is, so, is much more sacred. And I would keep the building unless you can come up with something better. Uh, so that, that's sort of, you know, a way of, that's my answer for that. The other one is that the community is the expert. When you focus on place, all kinds of people get interested. When you focus on a sort of a citywide master plan, you'll only get you know, a very limited number of people. But if you say, I'm going to work on this block where the art museum is, we, we were working on this place in Washington uh, where we had the Inter-American Development Bank, a women's museum, and a church, and we're working on a place there. Well, we got lots of people because it was their place right in front of them, and they needed to partner, and the bank didn't know the people at the museum, and the museum didn't know the people at the bank, and now they're partnering. And we had this other amazing thing happen where the church had the space for a daycare center, and the, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank had to use its ground floor for daycare, and they wanted to use it for other uses, so 
They're partnering with that, and all of a sudden, there was a synergy that started to be created among the different users around that space because they started getting together. And by creating a place, they started getting together. So I think that there are all of these series of places up there that you could draw people out uh, to help evolve and shape those blocks. But you don't start with a design concept. You start with activities and uses, comfort and image. Uh, sociability, is it working? How could it work better? What other examples are there? So you grow a place. You don't come in and say, here, I have a design for you. That's, that would just bomb, it would be the big, biggest bomb you could have. Tim Greaves, City Club member. Um, one of the, the things that a lot of people talk about as far as uh, a healthy downtown Portland is the viability of retail. And Portland has a, a pretty great retail core. Uh, I happen to uh, own a family business that's facing these proposed park blocks, and we've been there for 77 some odd years. One of the primary tenets has always been that retail needs retail right. to survive. And we have a history in the core of retail not surviving when it faces open spaces. Uh, how do you account for that? I agree. I actually agree with you. Uh, we have taken out many of the pedestrian malls in different parts of the country because it's like a, you put passive uses next to active uses. Active uses need to be supported with active uses. Uh, and uh, it's a, parks are incompatible with, with retail, uh, but they're very compatible with other retail activity. So a downtown is about activity. It's about a lot of activities and uses. It isn't about you know, an open space, and it isn't about just a, you know, gr grass, it's about busyness and liveliness. So I agree, I, you know, I agree with you. What business do you own? Uh, Carl Green Jewelry. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, hello, I'm Don Wagner. I just returned from Europe, saw some neat parks over there right. that uh, great people, uh, places. Yeah. And my question is, as you've, you have a sense of, of the Portland and perhaps even Oregon, although you, you don't understand how much it rains, but no, nonetheless, <laughs> you, you have a sense of what's going on here. You probably have a sense of what's going on in some of the other cities that you may have worked in. Is there any common denominator of if we're here and we want to be somewhere else, what is the process that gets put in place that works? Okay, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. I think most people are in jail, and they're just waiting to break out. Uh, and the jail is the professions, and the way government is structured. Uh, we're not structured to allow people to be leaders in their communities around building community places. We suppress them. The, the traffic engineer is the first round. Uh, you know, it's only about parks. What about all this other leftover space? What about a churchyard, and churches, and so on? There's no, you know, it's not in people's vision, and, and nor is the city government uh, allowing that kind of thing to happen. Not because they don't want to, it's just that they've structured themselves along different disciplines. Not about place, not about community, but along these disciplines. So I think as you transition away from what I consider an old way of doing things, and you reinvent government in a whole new way, and the communities are reinvented in a new way, you'll actually get an enormous uh, tide back towards what I think was historically the way communities shaped themselves, was around sort of intuitive, uh, natural, almost organic uh, evolution of community places. Uh, Christina Wolniakowski is, is a good friend who I've just Remet. She's here in uh, back in Portland, uh, running a uh, foundation uh, that is hopefully going to connect environment and community issues throughout the Northwest. And um, but she's from she spent the last eight years in Poland. And if you go back and look at those historic towns that were laid out, they were laid out around activities and uses, uh, around the sense of image. They were laid out about the idea of sociability. And uh, they were marvelous places for, for gathering. And I think we, in a sense, need to go back to that way of allowing ourselves to evolve the way we naturally would like to. This will be the last question. Lily Mandel, member. Um, one thing I would like to ask you, while you've been here, have you been, read the New York Times? Well, if you read the New York Times after the po Puerto Rican parade oh, yeah, in yes. Central Park, yes. you would not be suggesting that we uh, even attempt, which is ridiculous, to become another Central Park. 
There was oh. a riot out there. Oh, I know there. Oh, yes. So it's wonderful control, wonderful management. It didn't work. It's Giuliani. Uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, I, do, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, do you know that uh, a lot of Portland...